Our next speaker is John Skelton. John is a senior cloud architect in architecture platforms and integration department at UC Berkeley. John will be presenting on perimeters, a discussion of practical AWS security considerations for critical applications at Berkeley. Love that for something completely different. Um, hi, I'm John Skelton, integration team. Uh, so to answer Bill's question, why are we talking about uh, security perimeters? Uh, so if you are planning to take your uh, workload from on-prem and move it into AWS, you need to be aware that security perimeters are not the same. So we are focusing on security perimeters that are either new or different, significantly different. And we're also going to be looking at tools that AWS provides you to help you secure monitor them. Uh, so I want to go through uh, security perimeters that we uh, will be talking here. Uh, just to make sure everybody is on the uh, same page. So we've got network uh, security, pretty straightforward, uh, layer three, layer, layer four. Uh, also some tools that AWS provides to analyze at higher layers. Uh, data layer, we're mostly talking about uh, encryption of data. We'll also talk about management of uh, secrets. Uh, application layer, uh, this is two, two fronts to this. One is how do you, uh, <coughs> Uh, what tools does AWS provide you to help you write better software, and also what tools does AWS provide you to help you run other people's software better? Uh, block streams, I'm not sure if you can call that a security perimeter, but it's an important aspect of uh, uh, security. Uh, my, my personal favorite, or my, uh, my personal crusade, is the AWS account access control, uh, specifically uh, the uh, credentials that you get to access uh, your account, manage your account through uh, command line tools uh, or SDKs if you want to manage that. And then, of course, the uh, last but not least is since AWS has so much of their infrastructure, all of their infrastructure available to you to uh, query and manage through APIs, you can automate validating that your security uh, posture is correct. We can jump into the network layer. Uh, so security groups, if you do anything with AWS, you will quickly be, you will quickly encounter security groups. It's fairly straightforward. Uh, my, I would recommend you uh, consider codifying this in CloudFormation or uh, Terraform, I believe it's called. I mean, we're a CloudFormation shop. Uh, get it in uh, configuration, or excuse me, get it in uh, uh, version control, uh, like, you know, GitHub, Docker, that I need you exists. Uh, this allows you to go through uh, things like uh, peer review, etc., pull requests, all that good stuff. Uh, principle of least privilege is extremely important here. Um, honorable mention to ACLs. Uh, ACLs are similar, but they're uh, stateless. Uh, it's a bit, a bit more of a handful to implement. I wanted to mention it because you could actually implement um, uh, defense in depth at two different layers, maybe even organizationally. Like application organizations can deal with uh, security groups and a network security group to deal with your ACLs. Um, web application firewall, AWS is WAF. It, uh, some people uh, like it, some people don't. I think it, uh, it has its place here. If you want to uh, persist large lists of, say, IP address to a block, or you want to dynamically uh, block things due to some activity that you see, uh, web application firewall is a really good place to do this. So these, these tools generate uh, data. For example, uh, you can get uh, metadata about all the data that's flowing through your environment, um, your VPC, via VPC flow log. Um, also want to mention guard duty. Uh, if you're not running guard duty and you have sensitive data in AWS, uh, I would uh, ask you that you take a look at uh, guard duty. It watches three streams of data. Uh, DNS queries, if you have an EC2 instance or some sort of containerized application that gets infected by malware. A lot of times these malware will generate really unique uh, DNS queries that uh, they stand out. Uh, so it's easily, they can easily alert you if they see that coming out of your environment. Um, PPC flow logs, uh, mentioned that previously. Um, also, there's the, uh, my favorite, the uh, AWS API access. Uh, so this is administrative access to your environment. If I were to take my laptop and go to uh, a cafe in, uh, say, San Francisco that I don't generally go to, and I forget to fire my VPN, 
uh, GuardDuty will see that uh, this that I would be accessing my account from an IP block that I don't usually uh, access from, and that can generate uh, findings. You have to do something with the findings. Um, you probably, it's pretty easy to have the guard or the uh, to, yeah, guard duty findings go to a lambda function and have a, a relatively short lambda function that pulls out uh, critical or high severity uh, findings and say post to a Slack channel. You might want to follow up with uh, uh, further uh, filtering out of noise, but it doesn't take a lot to get a fairly high signal to noise ratio. And one of the things that guard duty is great uh, for is it's really inexpensive. So with a little bit of work, you can get uh, extraordinarily high signal to noise to dollar ratio. Um, so this is not necessarily how they implement it. This is my own personal mental model, which is something I realized after I put it in the slide. Uh, so the, uh, I want to go through a bit of this, starting with the hardware security module. I'm going to take a, uh, an example. Say you have a bunch of data sitting on a file system that needs to be available to some application to serve uh, legitimate uh, queries for your data. Um, how do you secure that data sitting on the file system, right? You can encrypt it. But if you, if you think about it, that just moves the secure the data problem from the data that you have to this decryption key. So how do you secure the decryption key? Well, you could encrypt it. So now you have a new key for it. So there's a really, um, there, there's a need for a sort of a root, an anchor for your encryption system. And that's where a hardware security module comes in. So you can have your data encrypted with a, uh, a decrypt or with a, a key, and then have the hardware security module encrypt the key. So when the application comes up, you have some way to authenticate uh, the application decrypting that key, and then you're good to go. Um, but but wait, there's more. Uh, KMS um, is built on top of a hardware security module, and it provides you with a simple uh, subset of functionality of an HSM to do uh, encryption, decryption, as well as managing these data keys. Um, so it, on top of that, they have uh, integrated that with a bunch of their data persistence layers, like RDS and S3. Uh, EBS are listed here, there's, there's others. Uh, but even better is, uh, on top of that, they've built a parameter store and secrets manager. So the secrets manager is perfect for my original example. Uh, you can have the data key just persisted in uh, either uh, encrypted uh, primary store or secrets manager. And then in your cloud formation, you can allow your application to uh, access the uh, decrypted data key directly out of secrets manager. Um, this actually works really well, and it's done correctly. It's, uh, it's an industrial strength solution, and it's really, really cheap. Of course, yeah, the done correctly part is, can be challenging. So there's, uh, there's, there's some complexity here. Uh, uh, so with the, uh, there's different types of KMS keys. One, um, there's the Amazon managed keys, which they come kind of pre-baked into your environment. You can just use them. They're free or very close to free. If you want to do some cool things like uh, provide for uh, disaster recovery, copying snapshots, for example, from one account to another, uh, this requires a little more tinkering. You'll need uh, customer managed keys to uh, extend the uh, access privileges on those keys. Um, we've talked about the rest of that. Um, it, in data in motion, it's uh, every once in a while it's helpful to jump on your systems that you have running out in AWS and actually run a packet capture tool and actually take a look at what is going across the network that is unencrypted. Um, I have found stuff that I was surprised to see was not encrypting the data, although I would uh, say the AWS stuff themselves are, is, is pretty good. Uh, so this is a, sort of a, an audit of one of our internal applications, exactly what is being uh, encrypted and what is not being encrypted. Uh, so the only thing I know that is not being encrypted across the VPCs currently is our DNS queries, which is expected. Uh, so the application perimeter. Um, so AWS, like I said before, has a bunch of tools that are available to you via API. So you can leverage this to write better software. We have this uh, application that um, when you uh, 
when a developer submits a pull request, um, it kicks off kicks off a bunch of automated processes. It actually builds out a test environment using the proposed uh, new version of the application, runs a bunch of unit tests, posts uh, the results of the unit tests to the pull request. It runs um, static code analysis, um, as well as takes a look at all the uh, uh, external dependencies, libraries, whatnot, uh, to see if anything, it, see if the application is now dependent on uh, libraries that have known uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, and all of this is automatically posted on the pull request, so when uh, 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 a team member jumps on the uh, pull request to do an actual peer review, uh, all of this information is just available to them uh, to see the general health of the, uh, of the new version of the software. We do something similar for AMI, um, Amazon Machine Images. Uh, when a new AMI is built, we use a, a AWS Inspector, which is a, a vulnerability scanner. Uh, so it generates a PDF, upload the PDF to S3, tag the uh, AMI with the uh, path to the PDF. So we have like the starting point of the, uh, of the AMI build. Um, as well as as the EC2 instances run, they are pre periodically scanned by AWS inspectors. So we have sort of a, a point in time uh, vulnerability scan of from the AMI all the way through to the current state of the uh, EC2 instances. Uh, third party security audits and pen testing. This is something that uh, I don't see a lot on campus and I think that's unfortunate. Um, I think it, it's something that uh, I, I would like to see more and more uh, organizations bring this into a standard operating procedure of having third-party people come in and take a look at the, uh, what you're doing on with the software as well as the architecture side. I've never gone through a pen test with a qualified team that didn't come back and tell me things that I really, really needed to know. Um, then automated network-based vulnerability scanning, we are totally <coughs> into that. Um, logs. Uh, so, I was just <laughs> discussing this with Kevin. I'm generally AWS positive, but I'm kind of down on AWS's logging facilities right now because it's kind of a mess. You have to really want to get all of this done. Uh, we need to have, we have a whole bunch of accounts. We need all the data um, that is generated from the various log sources uh, persisted into a, uh, a dedicated uh, log persistence account. Um, there needs to be a data um, lifecycle policy, for example, Data needs to be live online uh, for X number of months. It needs to go to uh, Glacier for Y number of months and then delete it after Z number of months. And uh, my, we're, my whole team is uh, like struggling to have the time to actually build this out. Uh, but we're taking it in phases. Um, we're closing out phase one currently. Okay, so I wouldn't be surprised to know that you all enjoyed reading, but do you enjoy reading indictments? <laughs> um, this one was uh, unsealed a little over a year ago uh, by a uh, Office of Special Counsel you may have heard of. This is the indictment of um, 12 uh, Russian GRU officers for various cybers, including the, uh, the exfiltration of a bunch of data from the DNC. And I can assure you that when I made this slide six months ago, I had no idea that this would still be in the news. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to read to you the last two sentences because there's actually a bunch of interesting uh, things from this that we can infer. After conducting reconnaissance, the conspirators gather data by creating backups or snapshots of the DNC's cloud-based systems using the cloud provider's own technology. The conspirators then move the snapshots to cloud-based accounts they have registered with the same service, thereby stealing the data from the DNC. So one of the critical things you can take from this is that the conspirators must have had some fairly uh, broadly scoped admin credentials into the accounts, the accounts that they had. That's the only way to copy snapshots, take the snapshots or copy the snapshots from one account to another. Now the uh, attackers here may have had other access, I'm not claiming I know, uh, but having the broad, broadly scoped admin credentials would be sufficient for all of this. So the question is, how did the attackers get a hold of the admin credentials? Uh, which begs the question, how were DNC staffers managing uh, those access credentials? 
which of course brings up how are we managing our access credentials. This is absolutely critical. So in my book, AWS gets a lot of points for getting their customers to do the right thing on their web uh, front end, their web management layer, getting their folks, to getting their customers to not use the root account, uh, getting uh, their access uh, covered by a two-factor authentication, all that's great. What they don't do particularly well is educate their customers on how to secure the admin credentials that are used for uh, AWS CLI as well as the SDK. If you want to sit on a workstation and get real work done, uh, you need to have, often you need to have uh, uh, broadly scoped admin credentials to do this. Um, so there's actually a few ways to approach this, but there's one that really stands out as excellent um, and there's a couple ways to implement it. Uh, and it, it all uh, boils around to um, the assume role call. So what you can do is you can have one account that has your users, right? So uh, these are IAM users. Uh, as you can see, there are no resources here except for roles that grant these users something, you know, some action. Then you have your actual resources deployed in other accounts. Now the only way these users can manage these resources is for these users to assume one of these roles. And one of the, the role is just a collection of uh, policies, of stuff to do, and they are best implemented as task-based roles. Um, so if you need to, I don't know, uh, roll um, uh, SSL certificates that are sitting on uh, load balancers, for example, uh, you might want to have a role specifically crafted to grant this sort of access. So the reason this is so powerful is there's, uh, for these users to assume one of these roles, you can specify uh, that the assume role must uh, meet MFA, multi-factor um, authentication requirements, which forces people to um, use two-factor authentication uh, in attaining uh, broadly scoped admin credentials, or even better, narrowly scoped admin credentials. Um, and they can be scoped so that they uh, last only a certain amount of time in minutes, right? So, you know, you, you go through your two-factor authentication, you get your credentials, they're good for a couple hours, and after that, they are worthless. Uh, so if somebody just lift them, uh, they, they have very narrow length of time to do what they need to do. All right, so last slide. Um, Continuous validation. This is a, this is a bit. I will admit a bit of a shotgun um, uh, pattern of a uh, slide here. Uh, when you go through um, all of the stuff that we I've been discussing, you find that there are some things in your infrastructure that are absolutely critical for your security posture. Uh, KMS keys come to mind. The IAM permissions, the uh, access control to assume roles, um, the policies that grant that, um, as well as uh, like the, um, the, uh, the security groups that we talked about on the, the first slide, the network uh, perimeter, all of these things are absolutely critical and you can programmatically test to see what the state is of these resources. Uh, if I'm calling them keystones, I don't know there's probably a better word. Uh, there's a bunch of tools that Andrews provides you to um, help you do this, CloudFormation, Drift Protection, and well, I mean, I don't want to go through the, uh, the list here. Um, you can read. Uh, I want to mention Canary Tokens, last point. Um, so you can create uh, AWS access keys that don't actually grant any access, except if they are used, they set off alarm bells. So you can sprinkle your code, your workstations, your servers with these, and there is no way for an attacker who steals these credentials to know whether they are any good or not. And right now, there are people on the dark web Cleaning, that they have piles of access credentials and they don't know if they can use them or not because they know the people that they stole them from use canary tokens. Um, all right, so one quick plug. Um, a lot of this stuff, uh, uh, the Dome 9 security folks, they gave uh, this, this, um, this presentation at last year's uh, uh, reInvent. Um, I want to plug it because it significantly impacted my team's uh, trajectory on approaching security perimeters, and um, they're also talking about perimeters, so I wanted to plug it. Um, it's a bit different. Um, it goes in much more depth, uh, and they're security professionals. <laughs>
So that indictment, was that about AWS? Yeah, they were on AWS. To the best of my knowledge, I'm pretty, I'm fairly certain. Another question here? Um, so I saw you mentioned EC2. Is all of this stuff pertinent to the other compute um, services like containers and Lambda? And yeah, um, most most of what we talked about uh, is I, I think um, it's a minority of things I've touched on that would not apply to uh, Lambda or containers. Uh, for example, I, I'm not sure how you, I'm not sure you could run. AWS inspector against the Lambda function, right? There, so it's a minority of things that would not work. So I understood some of what you said, <laughs> probably a lot, and both of them not club. together, right? Mm -hmm. But one of the time, a year ago, we were creating an Amazon solution for R Studio, which is web based. So we needed to um, break the perimeter to allow the work to go out to this. Web based access, and so there is use of works, Amazon workspaces and other things. Um, how does that fit into what you're talking about? Uh, so, I, w I haven't implemented workspaces uh, beyond kicking the tires on it. Um, there's, I have desire to actually implement that. Um, there is just enough lag to drive me absolutely crazy with Amazon workspaces. Um, so one of the things that you could do for workspaces is you could have a designated uh, network for deploying the workstations uh, hosted in Amazon workspaces. Uh, and then you could do cool things like the uh, when you assume roles that grant you your uh, broadly scoped admin credentials, uh, you, can, you can add uh, controls on it to say that these are only good on the following uh, IP address ranges. Um, there's been some blog posts. This, 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 this uh, topic came up immediately <coughs> after the Capital One breach because uh, uh, it's like how do you control where people are using your access credentials? So that's one way uh, that uh, workspaces come in handy. It's actually something that I want to implement. It's just I'm so spoiled having a local uh, command line, you know. Yeah. Sure. Um, so you mentioned you have a kind of a logging strategy that's long term. Do um, you want to tell us what you're going to do once you aggregate the piles of data and how you're actually going to analyze and view, view that? So this is this is actively being discussed on my team, right? So you have uh, um, uh, the load balancers log directly to S3. You've got WAF goes to Kinesis Firehose to maybe S3. Uh, you've got Lambda and EC2 instance applications going through CloudWatch logs. Uh, RDS instances create logs that go to, um, that just sit there. You have to figure out some way to get it out, right? You can log in and click on your RDS instance and download, for example, the uh, slow queries log for MySQL. Uh, so we're going to have an extraordinary a large number of pipelines to get to collect all this data and get it into an anal analytics environment. Uh, what the exact tools that we're going to use are unclear, right? You've got insights on uh, CloudWatch logs, and I've used it. It's it's functional, but it doesn't cover any of the other uh, uh, cases. Um, you've got uh, Athena, I believe, on S3, which I played with. It's really nice, but it doesn't cover a bunch of the other. Uh, analytics and we have a we already have a, an Elasticsearch implementation on campus, so there's a you know there's a, there's an affinity affinity there between team members in that technology. So it's very likely that we are going to have a whole bunch of pipelines to funnel all this data into uh, a whole bunch of Elasticsearch clusters. Uh, sitting there, the data will probably also have to live in S3 because the S3 to uh, Glacier uh, data lifecycle management is is bulletproof. Um, it's set up correctly, so that's probably what we're going to rest on. Which means we get to do everything. So I wish things were better there. I, I'm generally AWS positive, but uh, we need some help here. Uh, 
Hi, Kevin. <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question, but we're still struggling with it. Any other questions for John or any of the other speakers, Constantine or, or Corinne?